the mainframe. It's growing branches or, or root, upward roots. I, I don't know what it's doing. It's tangling up the deck of the ship. Doesn't matter. There's no way we can fight that thing. I've heard about what happens. It alters reality. Alters time. Alters time, eh? Well, we can do a little bit of that ourselves. Let us use the sphere. No, 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 no. We can't. We don't know what could happen. It doesn't matter anymore. It's our only choice. The sphere will unmake the mainframe. The sphere is everything and nothing. You'll wind up nothing if you use that relic. I won't let you do it! Let go of it! Whoa. Why did a disastrous time travel experiment suddenly become diddle little little? Oh boy, it must be morning time when people are strange. Greetings programs. Welcome back to Rune Hammer. This is the RPG mainframe. That's the podcast you know is gonna last. We're going to roll up, talk about RPG stuff. That's what you're into. That's what I'm into. I'm living this life. It's got its ups and downs. It's not always everything we dream it to be, but what is? This is where I, I this is where I belong, baby. Right here on the RPG mainframe. My name is Ingrid Bernal, and I will be your host for episode 45 five, 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 of the RPG Mainframe podcast. That's just me sitting right here with a microphone. You on the other side with the headphone. And all of us, hopefully, getting just a little bit more smarter than we used to be. Welcome. Episode 45 has like a sort of a clickbaity title. A little bit of a nihilistic title. So I apologize for that. But this is on my mind. We are entering... A bit of a postmodern era. You guys have heard me talk about this before, but it is just, it is, it is inflaming. It it is going to places even I didn't think it would. Craziness. Episode 45, that's today. That's right now on RPG Mainframe. Episode 45 is, do your mechanics matter? And I'm not talking about your mechanics, like you made up some mechanics and poo on you. No. No. By your mechanics, I mean the ones in your game. The ones being employed. Do they matter? Now, the the clickbait title for this podcast would be, Your Mechanics Don't Matter. (laughs) And then I'd be like, well, yes, they do. I better click this article and read it. But I'm not quite to that point. I'm not quite to the hubris or the arrogance. What insolence to say your mechanics don't matter. I can't do that. That's that's bonkers. On the flip side, I can't say your mechanics matter. I simply can't. And since I can't make that proclamation, I just have to ask it as a question. And this question is intended to bounce into your brain and put it into the first pa- person, which is, do my mechanics matter? That's really the question here. So as I always use this sort of imaginary professor as my my avatar of intellectual strength, right? I, I place myself in the imaginary role of knowing what I'm talking about and then conjure up an imaginary audience and speak from that professor tone. And this is a way for, for me to help myself think. And as I've mentioned before, it's a technique that Bruce Lee used. It's the, the imaginary teacher or the imaginary sifu or sensei, right? You, you put yourself in the position of going ahead and assuming that you're right about stuff and then speaking from this sort of axiomatic point of view. And that is how I have reached this question. Do your mechanics matter? Now, before we talk about if they do and how you can decide Because really, that is what we need, right? We need some kind of criterion or criteria 
to answer this question of yourself. And if you're like me, constantly looking inward, thinking about my GM capability, thinking about my design capability, which is more so what I've been doing recently, this question becomes even more important to answer. If you're designing gameplay, not just running it, you really need to answer this question and you need to answer it continually on multiple fronts. So before we jump into the criteria that can be used to answer that question, I just want to, as usual, explain to you guys a little bit how I came to this question. Why is this question worth an episode of the RPG mainframe? I tried to demonstrate in my little intro there sort of the concept that is at play. And one of the moments that drove me to this podcast was watching Jeremy Crawford's game uh, for the Descent to Avernus, which featured uh, numerous celebrity D&D players um, and was uh, intended to highlight their new, uh, at least Watsi's new book, Descent into Avernus, whose, uh, you know, marketing tagline is Mad Max meets Dante's Inferno. Now, one funny thing about that before we get into all that is it's actually quite funny that they call it Mad Max meets Dante's Inferno because the imagery and terminology is more like aped from Mad Max and Dante's Inferno, including the word Avernus itself. Avernus is a real place on Earth. It is a volcano in Italy through which... Virgil the Pilgrim descends into hell in Dante's Inferno. So to say it was inspired by Dante's Inferno, I feel is a a bit unfair. I think aped is a better word. But as I was watching the live play or the actual play of this game on D&D Live, it struck me that there were probably some new vehicle mechanics and some hell mechanics and some other things, new features that fill pages to make people buy books in the Descent to Avernus uh, release. And as the play was unfolding, it occurred to me that none of it mattered. (laughs) Now, it can just be the style of play that was occurring. But something down in my gut sensed a trend there, sensed a question and an issue large enough to occupy the circuitry of the RPG mainframe, a problem to insert into the strange computer cube and hope for some kind of answer. And this is the question, do your mechanics matter? And I think the answer in that game is no. (laughs) No, the mechanics did not matter. Now, if we look critically at that game, which I think is a healthy thing for the for the truly self-reflective game master to do, is look critically at how people are playing out there. If we look critically at this game, there's a lot that didn't matter. So the players were basically random characters from all over the D&D universe who had randomly materialized near a river in hell and who were randomly confronted with a colorful and humorous Mad Max aped character called, I think her name was Mad Maggie. Mad Maggie, yes. Again, the aping. And then they proceeded to romp a bit and do things. So I think that almost who the characters were didn't matter. I think that how the characters built, except for a couple of key moments, did not matter. They were generally just stat rolls. And then we bring it to the real question, which is the mechanics of things occurring in Avernus did not matter. There were no mechanical roles being made on vehicular action that were anything beyond stat saves. The uh, fact that soul coins were used to turbo power vehicles, especially considering you're playing theater of the mind with vehicles, That is very difficult to make mechanics matter when you're playing theater of the mind with something as complex as vehicles. Now, I'm not saying mechanics need to be complicated, but it would be cool if they mattered. I'm also not saying that the mechanics have to matter. That game flowed quite nicely. I think Jeremy Crawford was a very entertaining uh, dungeon master there. And although I think a few of the players were just basically comedians... 
some of the player moments were pretty cool. And if you guys are interested in watching it, I'll, you know, let you do that for yourselves. But I do think, you know, I'm not here to say that it was just doo-doo. It was educational. And what struck me is that so much of our hobby is focused on exciting new mechanics, right? And it should be. Exciting mechanics are part of the fun, especially if you're a researcher of RPGs like I am. Finding, vetting, testing, and comprehending new mechanics is the very essence of making your table game or your VTT game or your just your research hobby the very best it can be. But like so much geometry or topography in RPG maps, I really feel that many of the mechanics that are being presented do not matter. And so you guys know how I feel about arbitrary geometry in maps, right? You have all these squiggly walls and empty rooms and random corridors, right? And they just wind up not mattering. You really kind of move the action from place to place in a good game. In a, in a nightmare game, you have to explore every intersection, look left to right, the hours are whiling away. You're just trying to get to the next cool part. <laughs> so there's definitely a sweet spot between things mattering and not mattering. If every mechanic in your game matters, you're going to find yourself in a very, very slow technical game. Now, this is a lot like the challenge that Wargaming faces, right? Since this is a tournament-based PvP game, every mechanic kind of does matter. Just like when you're playing Magic the Gathering, especially in a tournament environment, your ability to master, utilize, and exploit mechanics is the very reason that you are competitive and possibly a winner. If you lose, you want to lose by those mechanics. And so every mechanic does matter. But we're in a role-playing sort of discussion here on the RPG mainframe, and mechanics cannot all matter. For one thing, they can degrade fun in cases. They can also eat up so much time that story arc isn't really allowed to move forward that much. And the precision of every mechanic mattering can actually pull away from the players and their characters being the spotlight of the game. The mechanics become the spotlight, and that's no fun because mechanics don't have emotions. <laughs> so we can't come to a place where all your mechanics matter. And we can't be in a place where no mechanics matter because that's just stuff. You know, no mechanics mattering is just we're sitting around and I give you an arbitrary dice roll and you make it and then we move on. Like that, that would be, even that's a mechanic, honestly, but that would be one mechanic mattering. So we can't be at opposite ends of the spectrum. We have to be somewhere in the middle. And that means we need a criterion to say, does this mechanic matter? This one right here. And that is what I would like to propose that I might have a solution for you. So we're looking at various collections of mechanics. Okay, let's say you've got the new Wizards of the Coast book and you're wading through some walls of text and you're seeking out the interesting new mechanics you heard about. Maybe you heard about their new uh, Navy battle mechanics, their, you know, ship fighting mechanics. Maybe you've got a brand new system in your hands You've got Fate in your hands, or you've got Genesis. You've never played these before. You've got Star Wars. You've got Edge of the Empire. Who knows? But as a game master, as you're reading through this new material, be it a new game or a new mechanic in, a, in an existing game, you're doing the same thing in your mind, which you're asking, A, does this matter? And B, do I want to take the risk and do the work to integrate this into my game? Now, if you're like me, these are questions you are constantly asking, constantly. It is the nature of the hobby. <laughs> it is what we do. It's what we enjoy doing, grokking, reading, understanding, integrating, evaluating, and moving on. We're researchers. We're a lot like wizards in a forbidden library. We get a thrill out of finding little nuggets, then bringing them into practice, like the magicians of the old, or even the old hermetic um, not students, but they're, what are they? Scholars, hermetic scholars. We are decoding deep secrets of RPGs, evaluating them and bringing into, into our game. So do they matter? 
Does this matter? Okay, here's a new rule for how ships can approach each other and have different components and we can be getting different roles going with different members of the group that have different effects on the way that the ship is maneuvering, firing its weapons, uh, avoiding hazards, and so on and so forth. Do the mechanics matter? Now, there's sort of two schools of thought on this. And I think the first school of thought kind of answers no as a default. These mechanics don't matter. Really what I need are stat rolls. So you cry out orders on the deck of a ship. You pull on the rudder wheel as hard as you can. You fire all of the cannons in unison. You throw the anchor around a jagged rock to spin the entire ship in an impossible Picardian demonstration of naval prowess. All of these things can be encapsulated by a target number and a stat roll, be it D20 or any other system. Target number, stat roll. You want to pull on the rudder wheel? Give me a strength roll. You want to yell at all of the uh, the crewmen to drop the mainsail extremely fast to perform a maneuver? Give me a charisma roll. You want to intelligently wire the cannons so that they all fire at the same time? Give me an int roll, right? So that's the first approach. It's saying, no, these mechanics do not matter. Really, it's all just coming down to those fundamental six roles that we all know so well. I think that actually the six stats we see in a lot of RPGs have become so ingrained that sometimes when you see alternative ones, like instead of strength, a game will call it might. I want to make a might roll. You're like, why isn't this just called strength? <laughs> we have reached that point. And the first analytical mind looks at new mechanics and says, these are all just overblown, cumbersome versions of stat rolls. Why do I need all these limitations and contingencies? Why do I need me and two other players looking these up at the table while we play when I can just make stat rolls? Then we have the second type. The second type has a default of saying yes. This, unfortunately, I think is the more common point of view, especially now that our hobby has a sort of large influx of casual players. Have you guys ever seen a post like this online? It will say, can I now make a tabaxi ship captain? <laughs> can I now make, you know, a, I don't know, a human evil paladin? Can I do that now? This is the mindset that says, I can do things that are put in the books. And, and only those things. This is the mindset that says, oh, here are the rules for ship-to-ship -ship combat. We can finally do ship-to-ship -ship combat. This mindset, for me, is very, very difficult to understand. Needing a book to tell you that you can now do an option instead of just freaking doing it, to me, is unfathomable. But... This, to me, is the effect that is occurring because of the influx of casual players in the RPG universe. There's a, a misunderstanding on a large part of the casual audience that we are allowed to do what is published. And, oh, I can't wait for this new book so that I can do ship-to-ship -ship combat. This mindset is unfathomable to me, but I do think it's a very widespread mindset. So it answers the opposite. It says, yes, these mechanics matter. Yes, now we can do these things because we have these mechanics from a canonical source. Now, obviously, because of you guys know me, I am much more like the first case than the second. I tend to say complex Overblown mechanics that are published tend to be less useful than making stat rolls. And here's where that live, uh, d d live actual play really got my goat and made me want to do this podcast. The official line that you're getting from Wizards of the Coast and Dungeons and Dragons is that, of course, mechanics matter. That's why we're publishing new material for you. So you can use these new mechanics. But then in their own live marketing material, 
they're not using any mechanics. They're doing almost a form of ICRPG play, except with a variable target. The save, the save throws seem to be just kind of all over the place. And without the players knowing exactly what was behind Jeremy Crawford's screen, the verisimilitude of why these sort of save targets are moving high and low at different times was somewhat unknowable. Now, occasionally you get a spike in difficulty because something seems difficult and you might expect a higher uh, DC on that. But generally we're seeing people play a very simplified game, even though they're playing under the flag of a mechanically robust game. This got my goat. And it made me ask the question, do the mechanics matter? Now, we haven't even really gotten to the criteria yet, have we? We've only said this question needs to be asked, and we've only said there are two generally default answers to this question. I find that the middle ground is not very common. The middle ground is the in-depth homebrewer, and really, I think in-depth homebrewers generally become publishers. In-depth homebrewing is not easy. It is very careful creation of elegant rule sets from research and intercombination, innovation and recreation. It, it, it is not, not a common hobby thing, I think. I think it's very common to simplify and it's very common to take as written. So let's assume for the sake of this RPG mainframe that you are not in the second group. If you're in the second group, almost all the time you think that mechanics matter as written and rock on. No matter what cost it may exhibit to the game, that's what you're going to play. And I, I may be presenting this as a bit of a straw man, but I think this is really is the most common point of view right now. Initiative is a perfect example. For some reason, vast swaths of players believe that the Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition initiative system matters. And if you tell them it doesn't, they don't like it. <laughs> so... We're going to assume for the sake of this podcast that we're not in that group because otherwise we would really have almost nothing to talk about. We're going to assume that we want to clean things up a little bit, that we're a little more critical with the mechanics that are either coming our way or that we're creating ourselves, which is really what I believe the hobby is all about. So do they matter? This is, a, this is the real question at the, the roots of things here. And how do we decide? I want to give you three checkboxes. If you're looking at a mechanic and it fills in all three checkboxes, it matters, it is awesome, and it should be in your game no matter how much resistance you get from your players or difficulty it is for you to retrofit things. It matters and you need to answer to the fact that it matters. Question one, checkbox one. Is it exciting? I cannot believe how many reams, legions of mechanics out there in RPGs are not exciting. And I know that this is a subjective question, and I leave that subjective answer to you in your own research and your own explorations. But is it exciting? Have you guys ever noticed the endless stream of questions about making travel interesting? <laughs> Show me some mechanics that make travel interesting. I see this so often. And I have to simply ask, why? <laughs> Is travel exciting? Generally, no. Movies would be so long if we had to endure travel. <laughs> There's a lot to do in the telling of an in-depth story that is not exciting. Camping is not exciting. <laughs> Let's face it. In real life, you go camping because you want to get away from it all. You want some peace and quiet. You want long stretches of silence as you look at trees. For the sake of an RPG, silence and looking at trees are not exciting. We can move through that with a montage. <laughs> Is it exciting? So many mechanics either occupy themselves with things that are not exciting 
or they add limitations and clunkiness to things that could have been exciting, but wind up causing a pause in play. Even the most exciting moments in play can be completely derailed emotionally if someone needs to crack a book open. Oh yeah, what's the mechanic on this? So let's take dying, for example. A lot of RPGs take the a, an approach toward dying that is much different. It can often be the defining element of a game system. Is this exciting mechanic of how your character may become deceased. Is that mechanic exciting? Is it an exciting gamble to die in this game? And this is a question I don't want to answer because I want to leave these answers to you guys. But what I want to give you is this criterion. I, I have my, my answers about what I think is exciting and what it isn't exciting on a lot of things. But it's the critical thinking method that this podcast is about. So checkbox one, is this mechanic exciting? It's just, and I trust your gut on the answer. It's just so simple. Is this awesome? Oh my God, that's so cool and fast and clean. That is going to be a blast to see people roll for this. That's checkbox one. Checkbox two. Does it present a dilemma? Does this mechanic present a dilemma? And so many mechanics out there in RPGs are basically occupied with the work of simulation. They are trying to give you an accurate picture of the probability or the detail of what's occurring. And that's useful to an extent. But a lot of mechanics are simply limiting player actions to keep them mortal, to keep them from going hog wild. And I think that's important too. Limitations can answer the first checkbox. They can be exciting. But limitations also need to present a dilemma. Now let's get right down to like one of the hugest mechanics of them all. Roll over D20 with a stat bonus. Okay, I have a plus three strength. I'm trying to beat a 15 and I'm getting roll, ready to roll my D20. This is exciting. It totally answers the first checkbox. Everybody knows how exciting it is to make a clutch stat roll. Does it present a dilemma? Absolutely. Choosing which stat to roll or what to do with your turn, which usually boils down to a stat roll, is huge. And this dilemma, I think, is sort of implied in our mechanic example. Should I run perception this round or should I crush the guy's head with strength, right? That's the dilemma being proposed by this mechanic. Choose a stat, roll a d20, beat the target, and succeed at what you're dreaming up, right? This is the core mechanic to so many games. And it presents wonderful dilemmas, a, a hugely different choice to the player. Do I use my wits? Or do I use my muscles? Like, that's really what this particular example boils down to. What a fun dilemma. But if a mechanic is simply there to inhibit, to, de to you know, declinate or to, um, you know, decrease or to block or to stop, does it present a dilemma? Now, here's an interesting one. Let's keep going with our examples. Attacks of opportunity. I have completely abolished them in all my games. I find that they truly bog down combat. They drive me crazy. They keep players from doing fun things. They get players killed in ways that aren't very satisfying. But I got to say, it's pretty genius when it comes to a dilemma. If you have three targets all over the place and your mage is getting punched in the nose and you need to go help the mage, do you risk that? attack of opportunity by disengaging your current enemy and running across the battlefield to help your mage. It's a really cool moment. But I don't think that attacks of opportunity answer the first checkbox. They're not exciting to me. It's just enemies usually getting a freebie. Or even worse, when players get free attacks because of opportunity, it can be super disruptive. Especially if you're playing something like Pathfinder, which can have relatively detailed uh, attack rolls. 
if that player isn't just ready to go, you know, with one in the chamber to roll that attack roll, the attack of opportunity can derail the initiative order. It can cause a delay in play and so on and so forth. So to me, attacks of opportunity do not answer the first checkbox, but they definitely get a huge check on the second one. But you got to get all three to be a cool mechanic. You got to get all three. So that second one is, does it present a dilemma? Another one that I would like to point out that kind of gets the second one but doesn't get the first is the uh, concept of hold in Dungeon World. Now, hold is a micro currency that is earned with a good roll. Hold is kind of like, you know, an energy point. If you get two energy points from a good roll, then you can sort of spend, quote unquote, those hold points to do a different array of things. You have a micro currency ex exchange to consider with your turn, and it presents a wonderful dilemma. How do you know, spend two hold to do this or spend one hold to do that and one hold to do that, right? It's a lot like choosing between brains and brawn. Very similar. Presents wonderful dilemmas. But what I find very quickly with Dungeon World is that the concept of hold is not exciting. It's so much more exciting to have everything sitting on that roll, sitting on that D20 roll, and are you going to make it or not? Man, the exciting excitement is right there. It also has the dilemma nailed. Which stat do I use? What am I doing this turn? It has it nailed. The concept of microcurrency is often really interesting to a designer, but when you get it at the table, it just doesn't have a lot of adrenaline to it because seeing someone consider how to use that mechanic in the game is not exciting, but the dilemma is brilliant. So checkbox one, is it exciting? Checkbox two, does it present a dilemma? Now checkbox three is one of the harshest ones of them all, but I truly, with every fiber of my be being, believe in checkbox three. Checkbox three for deciding if a mechanic matters. Is, is it easy to remember? Can you quickly, instantly, visually recall the mechanic in your mind without looking at a piece of paper, even after using it only once or twice? If the answer is yes, then the damn mechanic matters. If it meets the other two checkboxes. Aha! Now we've got ourselves an interesting design challenge. A lot of mechanics out there can be very easily remembered. But are they exciting? And do they present dilemmas? Interesting. Hmm, now I'm not so sure. Now, this is one area where fate provides us with an interesting example. A lot of fate's mechanics, I think, are very exciting. Fate, by the way, is the master of presenting dilemmas. Very good at it because of its use of verbal play. But... I think it is extremely difficult in fate to remember exactly how your word tags and your terminology and your fuzz dice or your fudge dice interact to create role outcomes. I actually think that Dungeon World, despite all its simplicity, has a similar problem. It's a bit hard for me to remember how the hack and slash move works. It's a bit hard for me to remember how spout lore works. It's written in such a way that it seems really specific, and I can't remember that specific wording. So are we even doing this right? And then the GM moves are even more baffling to try to remember. Even though it's a really interesting and elegant design, you just have a hard time conjuring it up in your mind. Now, I'm not saying it's impossible. It's just a bit more difficult. Now we can go over to something like Genesis, which uses these sort of codified symbol dice that basically without many sessions in your belt are impossible to remember. You always need to look up the little chart of what these things mean. Now, I may not be the sharpest tool in the drawer and it takes me a while to comprehend and remember things, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say that a lot of us are the same way. <laughs> that we are not all geniuses of visual memorization after seeing one thing once, photographic memory type stuff. Genesis, I think, is one of the most difficult mechanic systems to even begin to think about mastering it just much less teaching it's just but i think it's pretty exciting and i think it presents some cool dilemmas but then i just can't figure out what the hell i'm supposed to do without looking at the books over and over so this is one place again why d20 is so damn good 
roll over the number with your D20 and throw your stat on top. Not only is it easy for me to summarize and put into words, it's easy for you on the other side to understand exactly what I just said. Get your dice in your hand and begin to be like, here I go. It's fantastically simple and has so much potential to it. Now, I would argue that there are other mechanics out there that answer all three checkboxes. And I bet you guys right now in your heads are trying to list off ones that answer all three. Is it exciting? Does it present a dilemma? And can I just easily remember and teach it? I would argue to you, if a mechanic does not answer these three checkboxes, it should be chucked, chucked from your table. Then there's the other case, the dark case. This is a case of a mechanic that fits all three checkboxes that I don't want. <laughs> and the perfect example of this is classic initiative. I think initiative is easy to teach and remember, definitely presents dilemmas because the turn order can be very weird and it can be very exciting too because who goes first can be really exciting. The uh, you know A healer going first can be very exciting because that's a bad situation. You really want your healer going last and so on and so forth. But I don't want it in my game. I find people get skipped all the time. I find that it, it sort of eats up time in like micro amounts of trying to remember who's going next and so on and so forth. So actually that could be a ding on the excitement checkbox. But I just want you to let, you know, I just want to be out in the open that just because all three checkboxes sometimes get clicked doesn't mean I necessarily want the mechanic. <laughs> so I have to go against my own thesis a little bit there. But I think in general, especially when you're looking at something like just it's the it's a little bit my whipping boy in this podcast, but the the new ship combat rules in Ghosts of Saltmarsh are a perfect example when you're looking at considering mechanics to utilize or bring in. If they can make the three check marks for you, then rock on. If one of the check marks is distinctly empty, I would say chuck it. You don't even want it. If all three are full, but you still feel a weird feeling in your gut, chuck it. You don't want it. Generally, I think that all gameplay is better with a more critical treatment of new mechanics. I think new mechanics are not what your game needs. I think your game needs content. And to bring this whole thing back around to the beginning, that D&D Live event, Descent into Avernus, was about content. It was about, hey guys, we're in hell now. Ooh, and there's like giant war machines rolling around on spiked wheels. And it's like sort of a Mad Max kind of feel to things. And whoa, there's demons flying around and some kind of huge winged thing up in the clouds. And whoa, all that stuff is just content. So if you're going to hit me with new mechanics, you damn well better be sure that they're hitting all three check marks. Now, this is a place where we can have another podcast already brewing up, which is like, what are the three check marks for content? That suddenly becomes interesting, right? Because mechanics, you know, you don't need mechanics every week to make a game great. Anyone who has done a long campaign knows this, that actually having no new mechanics can be beautiful because the players get a complete grasp and command of your table's mechanics, your own freakish breed homebrew. They get it. They use it. They love it. Hold your ground. But then when a campaign ends, you're going into a new one. Great time to consider some new mechanics. Slip them in there, talk about them, and so on and so forth. So my argument here is that generally mechanics do not make these three checkboxes. It's very difficult to make all three if you're being critical. And if they're out there and they're being peddled or pushed upon you, then they should be rebuked. And I'm seeing the internal teams of game design companies even not using their own mechanics, which to me reinforces that critical thinking is being applied right there. We don't need these mechanics for this game. We're, we're filming this. This needs to be fun. But most of us, 99% of us are not filming. We want things to be fun because we want them to be fun. Whoa, imagine that. Not because we want to broadcast them and look cool. So before I jump into some giant diatribe about slightly unrelated topics, 
or before I start to talk about the three checkboxes that could make play content worth your while, I'm going to have to sign off. I hope this helps you guys consider mechanics. Consider if they're useful. Do they need to be in your game? Do they need to occupy space on a character sheet? If they're exciting, if they present fun dilemmas to players and even to you as the game master, and if they're easy to remember and teach, then they damn well deserve a spot on a character sheet. And if you can't fit all the fundamental mechanics of your game on a character sheet, you should be taking a hard look at why there are so damn many of them. <laughs> all right. This is old Ingrid Burnall here. Your hostess with the mostest up on the RPG mainframe to podcast you know who's going to last. Thank you guys for your continuing support as well as sounding off on our latest poll here on Patreon. And thank you everybody for your support in May. That was a great month. Had a lot of fun. But I think for June, we are just going to get back to podcast mania. No publishing in June. We're just going to hit the podcast. We're going to talk RPG. We're going to be neck deep in the life. That's what I'm here to do. I hope that's what you're here to do. This is old Ingrid Bernal. I'm signing off. I'll see you all on the internet.